Hello everyone and welcome to the second applied holography session of this conference. Thank you. Uh, the convener for this session is Michal Heller, who is going also to give the first talk. On uh, you're Geometry. the boss. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Giving, uh, the, the title of the talk is Geometric Interpretation of Time-like Entanglement Entropy. Yeah, thanks for the introduction. Thanks for coming to the session, because that's not obvious if there are many of them. Um, I'm very happy to be in uh, Southampton. Uh, in the past uh, years, we had many papers with Ben Withers in particular here, but somehow like it was entirely online, and, and this is like the first time uh, ever, stand, ever since we started working uh, together to, to be here. It's good to be here. Uh, what I want to talk about today uh, is a paper we put on the archive uh, last week uh, with Alex Serantes, who's there, who might be like the most featured person in this conference program, uh, because he also appeared in, in, in David Mattel's stuff, uh, and Fabio Ori, who's a PhD student uh, with us at Ghent University. So uh, let me start uh, with a bit of a broad introduction. So what I want to talk about um, is uh, an idea within uh, what I like to call, call uh, top-down sharp geometric probes of the bulk. So uh, it's, uh, well, it's probably obvious for everyone that holography encodes gravity in the language of boundary CFTs. Um, and what we know about the bulk ultimately stems from the holographic dictionary, from the zero of order entry in the holographic dictionary. And uh, the zero of order entry to the holographic dictionary gives us uh, direct access uh, to correlation functions, thermodynamics, and entropies. And while all these quantities are geometric, uh, sort of by definition, I mean, everything in holography on the bulk side should be geometric, uh, they are only sometimes sharp uh, in the bulk. Uh, so in particular, if you take a two-point function of a heavy operator or a time slice, then uh, you can approximate it rather well as an exponent of the geodesic length, right? That's rather sharp in the bulk. It, it probes bulk sharply. And similarly, if you consider a subsystem on a constant time slice, then you can calculate its von Neumann entropy via uh, RT, HRT formula, and that's also a rather sharp uh, quantity. So uh, one can ask what they are good uh, in the bulk, um, and what I want to signal on this front that there are also bottom-up sharp geometric objects like holographic complexity, uh, but these are in the vast majority of cases at best only qualitatively understood. And uh, regarding what these things are good for is that if we have a sharp quantity in the bulk, uh, then due to their localized nature, they allow to directly probe, for example, black hole uh, regions of interest, such as horizon, interior, singularity. And if they are top down, so not really in this category, but if they are top down, then uh, you know, in principle, we can calculate them independently on the boundary. And the mesh with bulk representation indicates that bulk geometry works. So that's like a non-trivial, uh, interesting uh, test that one can do. And what I want to talk about today is the so-called timeline and time entropy that was brilliantly introduced uh, by the Kyoto group uh, about two, two years ago. And as I said, like for standard and time and entropy, what you do is like you pick a time slice. On this time slice, you pick a subregion. And then uh, the subregion, well, acts as a, as a boundary condition for uh, Ryuta Kanagi HRT uh, surfaces. So in particular, in the setting of ADS3 geometry that is depicted here, the subregion of interest can be taken as a single interval. And then uh, this group over here uh, asks a provocative question. What would happen if instead the subregion being a uh, space-like uh, subregion, we're going to consider a time-like one? So in the context of ADS3 holography, uh, what would happen uh, if we consider instead of a spatial subregion, that is an interval, uh, consider a time-like subregion that is going to be interval that extends along the time direction instead. And uh, basically, the, the, a way of uh, characterizing uh, this kind of a subregion was, was, was dubbed by them uh, holographic time-like and time entropy. So, so, so there's, a, there's a reason to, to, to do these things. I mean, in life, one can do various things, right? But there are various reasons uh, not to do things and various reasons to do things. Here, there are strong reasons to consider uh, this kind of an idea because of a transfer network connection. So, uh, well, if, you, if you're interested, like, please have a look at this slide uh, in uh, your quiet time uh, because it's, it's really interesting. I don't want really to get into this. It's called temporal entanglement. Uh, but in practical terms for, for us, uh, high energy uh, slash gravity uh, physicists, 
There is a, there is a, a nice way of understanding this that uh, boils down to the original uh, references, uh, which uh, comes from the universal uh, result for entanglement entropy for a single interval in the vacuum of a conformal field theory. So this is the expression. And now, of course, when we have this expression, what we can do is we can take it and analytically continue from x1, x2 lying in a spatial direction to x1, x2 now extending the time direction, which basically amounts in practical terms to introducing a factor of i in, terms of in, in front of these coordinates. And when you do this, after the dust settles, uh, what you end up uh, is, uh, for example, this expression. So this expression has a logarithmic growth with a time separation, but more importantly, it also has an i pi half factor that indicates that the quantity that we're talking about is not really an entropy. And indeed, these, this reference over here uh, pursued an idea that one should, uh, one should look for interpretation of this, of this object in terms of a pseudo-entropy. And this goes uh, hand in hand with the tensor network uh, picture. So that's, that's very nice, that's consistent. And but I'm not uh, talking uh, about this aspect of the holographic uh, time lag and time and entropy. What I'm uh, talking about is the bulk interpretation of, of, of this analytic continuation that uh, I just uh, described. And uh, this reference, uh, the original reference, uh, pursued a tempting bulk picture uh, based uh, on a comparison with the analytic continuation of the universal CFT results. And this bulk picture was, uh, was very uh, beautiful and sort of convincing. And it is based on an idea that, you know, when we calculate uh, and how an entropy, right? We're calculating the length of the geodesic. This geodesic, or in, this ca in this case, in ADS3, this geodesic is, is, is spatial, right? So the length is uh, real, uh, non-negative, non in particular, positive number. Um, and when you study this expression, perhaps, perhaps you can co conclude that, okay, I mean, that might come from some geodesic, like a spatial geodesic. But now, like, in the... In the convention in which we assign to special geodesics uh, real non-negative numbers, to timeline ones, we assign uh, purely imaginary ones, right? So if you follow your nodes, then perhaps uh, you can assign a timeline uh, geodesic segment uh, to this part of the answer. And then uh, the geometric interpretation pursued in this reference is, uh, is a curve that is uh, piecewise made uh, of geodesics, two uh, pieces that are uh, space-like and one piece that is time-like. And uh, myself and, and probably also my collaborators like things that are exotic, and this is very exotic because basically you don't think about combining together time-like and, and, and space-like uh, geodesics. And uh, what we wanted to do, and, and, and to some degree I will try to convince you that we succeeded, is to work out the prescription uh, for uh, calculating this kind of a quantity in uh, ADS CFT, and in particular, apply it beyond ADS3 CFT2, where it's easy, at least in some cases, to, to get an answer for temporal and time entropy by analytic continuations, right? So let me start with our proposal. This proposal is going to have several incarnations uh, because we work uh, things uh, up, starting from uh, ground zero. So the first version of our proposal is that uh, holographic time-line and time entropy is going to be uh, Bekenstein-Hawking uh, entropy or pseudo-entropy or whatever you want to call it. It's basically a proper area over 4G Newton of a complex boundary uncored extremal surface of co-dimension 2. So basically, the idea is that we are supposed to do exactly the same as uh, RT and HRT did, but now uh, considering uh, boundary uncourt uh, complex extremal surfaces, right? So like that's, that's our proposal, version one of it. And uh, the key features are the following. Uh, so extremal surface means that we extremize the surface function no matter what. I mean, like we just sit down and calculate the, the Euler-Lagrange equations, and then we, we just solve them, right? typically numerically, but in, in the case of ADS3, you can also do this analytically. Complex here means that the surface lives in the bulk metric in which the coordinates it's themselves are complexified, right? So like the, the time coordinate is no longer a real valuable, actually it's a complex variable, and similarly all the spatial coordinates, right? And boundary uncourt uh, means that the surface satisfies the real boundary conditions on the standard asymptotic boundary of ADS, right? So we should think about uh, complexification of a bulk geometry 
But the boundary conditions we, we still impose on the standard section of this complex ge geometry were for, with which we, we normally deal in ADS CFT. So that's, that's roughly speaking the idea. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. So the function you're explaining that's the idea, right? Yeah. <coughs> so is, is it true that the idea is still going to be real on a complex geometry? No. Then, what do you mean by extremizing that? Well, let, let, let me keep going, right? So, 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 so let's 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 look at the the the, the example. So, like, I, I want to look at exactly the same example that that we had before. So, we may introduce a fine parameter in such a way that the the total length of the geometry of the of the geodesic is going to be two lambda star. This lambda star is going to be actually complex number, right? Like, we know that it has to be complex because of the analytic continuation that that I talked about before. And now, the the idea is that you know, like, uh, we can we can find as it turns out, accidentally, in, in this ADS3 complexified geometry, a path in such a way that this path piece wisely is going to acquire interpretation of a path in real geometry, right? So in particular, if for, for, for this case, if we consider this path in which we go uh, a, parallel to the real axis, it turns out that we can interpret this path as, as these two uh, standard uh, space-like GDZs. But then something very funky happens as we go along the imaginary direction. And it turns out that what happens is that our, our geodesic uh, wants to move outside. And once it reaches the, the Poincare horizon, it wants to go to, to, to a complex, complexification of the ADS space. And this complexification is not really an arbitrary one. It is a comp complexification in which in Poincare coordinates, like the z, so the radial direction gets multiplied by an i, and t, so, which is the temporal direction, gets multiplied by an i. And if you go back to, to the standard uh, ADS-CFT uh, picture, uh, you know that simultaneous rescalings of all the coordinates by a constant factor is an isometry of ADS, right? So, so in the end, like the section that we are probing here looks basically the same as, as, as the standard real ADS. But what I want to emphasize is that these factors of i are really crucial in this picture. And in particular, they are crucial in this picture because what you want to impose is that this is an extremal surface. And as a result, what we want in particular is that the momentum along this, this geodesic is continuous as, as, as we follow the whole geodesic, right? And when we think about gluing a space-like and time-like piece, then we cannot do this in a continuous, continuous manner because, of course, we can guarantee that the point at which they meet is, 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 is reasonable, right? But we cannot guarantee that the, the momentum uh, is continuous, right? I mean, like that, that's also the reason why it's not that, you know, like we, we move at a time-like trajectory and, and, and not that like we, we make like a little excursion into spatial, spatial direction, right? That, that never happens. And, and, and that's, that's the difference in the interpretation of this analytic continuation of the, of the CFT result. So, you know, like this is, we, we recover the picture of this kind with an important, or like maybe I should even say key subtlety, which is that uh, imposing the, the extremality condition, so imposing the, the Euler-Lagrange equation, forces upon us that this, this curve moves into a complexification of the standard uh, ADS space. And then it happens to be so that we can nevertheless interpret uh, this complex curve in a similar manner to this uh, original uh, work. So what I want to, to emphasize on this, on, this, on this telling example are uh, a few uh, important features, which is that, in a sense, nobody enforces upon us this particular path in a complex affine parameter plane. In particular, we can take any path we want. And uh, if we do so, uh, I mean, we are free to do so, then actually this path in general, I mean, is going to be anchored on the real uh, standard boundary. But what it does uh, inside uh, is a bit crazy. I mean, like it propagates uh, in, in general in a complex uh, space-time uh, geometry. But what I want to emphasize, uh, and, and, and I hope this is not too radical, for our proposal, it does not matter. I mean, for us, any equivalent path uh, is, is perfectly good. So, so, so if you just uh, go along with the flow, the good thing about it is that with this proposal, you can generalize this to situations in which uh, it's far from obvious if you can find any real sections of these paths, and we believe that such sections do not necessarily exist. 
So uh, what I want to discuss now is a prediction. Um, so we want to take it to, to the case where, as I said, like, uh, it's very hard to, to, to see if it would be even possible to, to find like, segments that are time-like, space-like in some real geometries, right? Like probably they even don't exist. And we believe that the, the simplest uh, non-trivial example of the sort uh, is going to be a time-like strip and ADS4 black brain. So like ADS4 is like one dimension higher from what we had. So previously what we discussed was ADS3 and there like this was a complex geodesic. Now we talk about complex uh, two dimensional uh, surface, co-dimension two, remember. So, so this is the setup that we study. So like this is the boundary. So in the boundary we want our strip to extend in the time direction. Uh, it's gonna be localized in one of the spatial directions and it extends to infinity uh, in the other spatial direction. Uh, this is the standard uh, black hole metric that we all uh, know and love in uh, Poincaré coordinates. The horizon is going to be at z equals zh, and uh, I mean the standard real horizon that, that we are used to. And then the black hole singularity is going to be at z approaching uh, infinity. Now, uh, the bulk picture that we have is that uh, because of translational symmetry, it's going to look like this. So there's nothing interesting happening in this x curve direction. Uh, x parallel also like there's not much interesting happening because we have a translational symmetry over here. And what we're going to have is we're going to have an extremal surface that is anchored on the future boundary of the strip and the past boundary on the strip on the real asymptotic boundary. And then it's going to extend into the bulk um, in a complex manner. So like this is demonstrated uh, in this picture by the fact that this surface changes color, so it starts uh, orange or red, depending on your eye, uh, which means real, and it ends up uh, bluish, which means uh, it's, it's, it lives in a, in a fully complex uh, manifold. Can I ask something? Well, it depends. Please ask, and then okay, we may move very it. very much like the computation I would do for a Wilson loop. So what makes it complex here? Maybe I missed that one. The, the fact that uh, it extends along the time direction, and uh, if you play with it, you're not going to be able to, to, to satisfy yeah. the boundary conditions, uh, ensuring that the surface is simultaneously real and you satisfy the boundary condition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that, that's a very nice point that you make. Uh, in a sense, like whatever technology we're, we're developing here can be also applied to, to, to Wilson uh, loops and objects of other codimensionality. It just happened to be so that we started exploring it uh, in the context of codimension two uh, quantities. So um, what I want to say now uh, is that uh, this uh, definition that this proposal that we adopt is, is actually the one that uh, is actually quite conservative uh, in a sense that it's, it's very reminiscent of the proposal for entanglement entropy. And as a result, like a lot of the things that uh, you know from the story of entanglement entropy uh, also applies here, although like with, with some twist to the story. So um, in particular, what you know for entanglement entropy is that like, you know, like as uh, you make uh, the entangling region large enough, then most of the, of the surface is gonna approach uh, the critical uh, sort of surface uh, in the bulk lying at a constant radial profile, right? So sort of like the zero of order instinct that you might want to have in the study of this quantity in novel uh, background is to identify what will be the critical points. So what will be the extremal surfaces that lie at a constant value of Z? And now remember that we are considering uh, in this business complex extremal surfaces, right? So like we're gonna be looking for uh, values of Z that in general are complex where such surfaces are located. So in the context of uh, ADS4 uh, black brain, it turns out that uh, there's gonna be uh, three uh, such uh, complex uh, extremal surfaces lying at constant Z that are denoted here uh, by uh, these uh, red uh, crosses, red, red axes. And uh, sort of like the way we should think about it is that like as the, I mean, the, these are candidate points that would correspond to a situation in which the separation in time gets very large, right? And the surface sort of like tries to align for most of its lifetime in the bulk along these points, right? Like that's far from obvious that uh, your surface anchored at a real boundary is going to extend and, and, and touch these surfaces. I mean, it's not clear that you're always going to be able to solve this. But in this particular case, it turns out that you do, in a sense that there's going to be solutions that uh, at large separations align along these critical uh, points. And then as you shrink the separation, then they do whatever they want to do. And so, so it turns out that, that there are like these, these two classes of solutions that we call uh, vacuum-connected 
and vacuum disconnected. So the, the idea is that the vacuum, that, that, that they exhibit, they, they end on the corresponding critical point, but they exhibit a vastly different behavior at short distances. So at short distances, the vacuum connected one, which is why we call them like this, exhibit an area behavior that is the same as you get in the vacuum ADS without a black hole, right? So you can, you can turn off, you can take the horizon to zero, right? You can do the calculation in empty ADS. You can see how it be, how, how there, like you, what was the answer there like for short separation? And it turns out that you're gonna get an answer that corresponds to this branch of solutions. And now like as you make separation larger, then you start approaching the, the critical point. And then of course like the answer is, is complex. So in general, over here, like we, we have two kinds of surfaces, like one lying to the bottom of the real axis, the other one lying to the top. But now like the, the interesting beast here is this one. And, and this one basically is interesting because this is the first situation in which we are facing the case where there are multiple possible contributions to the same quantity. Like similarly in entanglement entropy, like it's not that you're seeking for the thing that you know is just an extremal uh, surface of codimension two. There are additional uh, criteria that tell you which one to pick, uh, depending on uh, you know the overall situation. I, I mean, like the minimal of area and also like the the, the homology constraint. So over here, I mean, like this is the, precisely the situation in which we wanted to end up in because this is a situation where we have to refine our prescription and try to see uh, what are the options uh, in this refinement. So the, the funny thing about this vacuum disconnected branch is that as you make, if you are along this branch of solution, if you make the separation between the boundary, boundary uh, subregion, time-like subregion to be very, very small, the funny thing is that the tip of uh, these uh, surfaces approaches uh, the complexification of the black hole singularity. So sort of like these surfaces uh, have built in something that is a stark violation of the UV IR correspondence in which on the boundary, we are trying to probe very short distances, but in the bulk, like this thing sort of like explodes and goes uh, into the, the black hole singularity, right? So like that's, that's why this is very interesting. So, so of course, like the question is which one to pick and I still have like uh, two, two, two or three minutes. So let me discuss. So like the option one, is an option that would be the conservative one, which is, okay, I mean, let's pick the one that has a minimal real value of the proper area, right? I mean, that, that, that's very natural. This is indeed the first thing that we considered. And if we do this, actually, actually, uh, according to the, to the area behavior, it's gonna be the one that probes at short separations, the black hole singularity that you would be picking, right? So, so this, this kind of a proposal uh, is, uh, very radical because it violates in a, in a, in a very stark way the UV uh, IR uh, correspondence. So this leads us to the version uh, 2B of our proposal, so like a second refinement of our proposal, which is that we want to pick the, the complex uh, boundary uncoordinated extremal uh, surface of codimension 2 that reduces to entanglement entropy upon analytic continuation. So in particular, uh, in this uh, picture, what we would be picking is uh, the, the one that is the vacuum uh, connecting uh, branch. So what I want to, to signal here uh, to the audience is that um, for entanglement entropy, also, at least like in a few situations that are particularly soluble, subleading contributions, I mean like the non extremal surfaces that are non-minimal are nevertheless interesting and acquire physical interpre interpretation. What I have in mind is the story of entwinement and entanglement among uh, internal degrees of freedom. And even if we rolled with this second refinement of the proposal in which we pick uh, the, the, the boring, so to, so to speak, boring blue curve as the right manifestation of uh, temporal entanglement entropy or holographic time -like entanglement entropy, uh, still there is a place for understanding the, the green solution, which is the one that touches singularity, because it might be like sort of like time-like entwinement uh, if, you, if you wish, right? Very good. So um, what I want to signal is that, uh, of course, it's very close to entanglement entropy in a sense that it's also an extremal surface. So like all the setups that you want to, to see how it works are also the setups where, where you, you, you saw how entanglement entropy works and one of such setups are quenches. And um, so we consider the Vega spacetime 
And uh, I don't want to get in, into the details of the story because I just have like one minute, 30 seconds or something like that. But what I want to signal is an interesting aspect of it. You might think, okay, we're going to analytically continue the geometry, right? And then the Vedia spacetime uh, in the context of quenches is typically the one in which like the, the, the shell is in the thin shell limit and the mass of a black hole changes in a, in a basically a step uh, like fashion, right? And then uh, you can ask, okay, Miha or actually Alex, uh, what would you do uh, in this case when you have a, a heavy side uh, theta function? But the beauty of it is that uh, what you can do is you can resol resolve this, this uh, heavy side theta, for example, with a tangent hyperbolic or, or some, some other uh, resolution such that in the limit you recover it. And in such a case, you do the calculation according to our prescription. You go with the flow, and then you get an answer, and you, you start taking like, the regulator to be smaller and smaller numerically, right? And at some point, like, you see that, uh, that uh, it uh, ceases to, to change. And this is basically what I wanted to, to signal with these plots. So since I don't have uh, any time, let me summarize and give you some, some outlook. Um, what I talk about today is, uh, is, is based or is, is, is stems from a brilliant paper by the Kyoto group that introduced this notion of uh, temporal uh, entanglement entropy, time like entanglement entropy in holography. And what we did uh, in a recent paper with Fabio Ori and Alex Serantes is providing a bulk uh, prescription and studying uh, geometric interpretation and geometric uh, uh, basically uh, implications. And the take home that I would like you to, to, to remember from this talk, if anything, is that holographic time lag and time and entropy is necessarily given by a complex extremal co-dimension to surf, surf, hypersurfaces plus additional conditions that uh, you have to take into account to select uh, the, the ones that, that contribute um, when there are more surfaces than one. And the outlook that I want to display uh, is, 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 is multifold. I don't have time to go through it. So let me, let me just uh, stress something that is related to your question earlier in my talk, is that you can perhaps view what, whatever we're doing as, as kind of a tip of the iceberg of novel bottom-up and maybe even top-down uh, holographic uh, geometric probes. In this case, like probes of uh, complexified uh, bulk metric. Thank you. Yes, uh, I know you cited Takinagi's work, but can you say a bit more just what the quantum information definition is? Because I know there's a definition that predates Takinagi, which is that if you take um, the usual story with the left and right window wedge that the Minkowski vacuum is in tangled state, you can rotate it by 90 degrees. And so there's intuition that you can have something like in a correlation in time, mm. where something at this moment is entangled with something in the future. Is that what your measure is? Or something new, something different? No, well, it's certainly similar because you can, you can uh, think about, in the case of, of CFT2, as I discussed, you can think about it as analytic continuation of the standard entanglement entropy, right? So, so, so I think like what you just said is, is, is an analog of this in, in, in Rindler Wedge. But sorry, but, and the, I, I mean, I know, I know these words, but analytic continuation sounds like continuing an, continuing an answer, but the entanglement entropy is defined with the factorization of Hilbert space and subregions. Yeah, yeah. And so how does that work with in, what's the subsystem that you're considering? Well, I'm like, I, that, that's why I moved to this slide that, that the, the only place where, where I can uh, have an idea how to, how to make sense of it is, is, is basically tensor networks, right? Like where the system, like you, you can have discreteness built in, uh, in the context of discrete tensor networks. And then sort of everything is a matrix. So, so in a sense, like once you end up with a matrix uh, in, 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 in it, it's not uh, a crazy thing you know, to diagonalize this matrix, ask what are the eigenvalues, or to, to calculate holonomic entropy, right? So, like, okay. so this is sort of like the setting in which I think this uh, quantity is 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 the best uh, defined. And indeed, like, if you look at the the papers that Luca Tagliacozzo and collaborators uh, wrote uh, on this topic, it turns out that uh, the 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 properties of these uh, temporally defined matrices uh, have to do with sort of like the hardness. Of, uh, of time evolution uh, with the tensor networks, right? So like if these matrices in particular have a rank that does not grow with time separation um, fast enough, then tensor networks are capable of efficiently 
uh, modeling the, the time evolution of the system. So like that's sort of like the, the, the nice uh, sort of practical way of, of thinking about this quantity. But like just last sentence to, to, to this is that, of course, you can also invoke the replica trick, right? And, and in the context of CFT2, you can think perhaps in the replicated uh, theory of, a, of an analytic continuation and of a, of a two-point function of, of, of twist operators at uh, temporal uh, separation, right? And, and that's like an alternative uh, picture that I want to, to, to take home. Uh, <laughs> Julian drove his hands. <laughs> Uh, so, can you you mentioned uh, by the quench? Can you also consider uh, the two-sided Hartman model design, like uh, time evolution, where the two sides are time-like separate? Well, there, uh, like in this case, uh, of course, like two sides are uh, by default uh, yeah, right. spatially uh, separated, right? right. But, but of course, what you can do is you can consider this kind of a quantity that is anchored on two, two temporal strips, right? And then you can think about like the situations in which you have uh, two possible contributions, like one that is a disconnected one between the two sides and one that is a connected one between these two sides. But, uh, well, I'm not even sure if we did uh, such studies. Uh, that's probably still in, in the books. But it's, that's a good point. I'm like, uh, you, you, you can look into this as well, yeah. Thank you. Thanks for the question.